Deer stalking, dark arts. Neil Roundtree looks at the problems of night shooting deer. Our first option will always be to shoot them, stalking them in daylight hours to minimise stress and to produce a good venison product. And when we can, we'll commercialise elements of it by having people pay us for the experience. But right at the tail end of our options is the shooting of deer at night. Size is everything. Wayne Martin brings his giant ferrets to help out their tiny cousins at the South Somerset Ferreters. One rule is your ferrets, you've got to dig them out. <laughs> and Ukraine aid. Hunters and shooters pull together to bring refugees out and send hunting kit in to help in the war against Russia. We're giving away a set of Muller chokes priced up to £150. We have news. We have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. We're back up in Scotland because we have unfinished business. Over the last five years, we've shown how the wildlife and countryside here is under increasing attack from the ill-advised. There's growing concern in the countryside that government's arm's length management is setting landscapes and species on a dangerous path. So in a flying visit to the west coast, we're going to cover a few burning issues. In this film, it's the dark side of deer management, night shooting. Agencies in Scotland have been quite proactive over the years and giving us tools that we can use to manage deer. So one of the ones we're going to look at the next couple of days is the use of night shooting. So here what we've done is we've taken as many deer as we can in daylight hours by stalking at dawn and dusk using high seats, vantage points. But there, there's a few deer that remain in here and the deer have become largely nocturnal. So what we're doing is we're going around to ascertain that it's a safe site, where we can shoot them, where we can't shoot them. And what we'll do following that is we'll come back here in darkness, try and demonstrate what best practice is for shooting deer at night. What you need resources wise, what you need equipment wise, what to expect, and also to reinforce the point that to me, it's a suite of tools available to the deer manager, but legislation is specific about how you can use it. Let's begin with the morning after the night before. Neil has shot a stag under the lamp, but he felt it too tricky, even dangerous, to extract at night. You grabbed him last night? Yes, grabbed him and took the red out of him, but the reason we didn't extract him was when we shot him last night, you can see it's quite a difficult site. It's an area we need to get them out of. You can see there's development going on right on the doorstep here. And the chances of encountering an old stag like this, and this guy's about 10, 11 years old at least, catching him on the go in daylight is practically impossible. So they've been establishing woodlands to offset the landworks of the development here. So we came in and nine, 10 o'clock last night, we, we caught up with this guy. So it's first thing this morning and that's us back in to extract him. Now we can see what we're doing. But there's a balance to be struck between uh, your team's safety and the speed that the venison gets home on. So we'll see what like he is when we get him home and what we're gonna do with him. His head and shoulders yeah. want to sit on here, so we'll pick him up like that. And as if I lift him, if you just run him back toward me, keep him coming, keep him coming. And yet, yeah, and fine. Right, so, so if you unhook me from the top there, there should be a rope sticking out the top of the bag. Yep, one, oh, you yeah. one. Got it? Yeah, keep the bag on. Grand. Yes. There's plenty of kit on show, tens of thousands of pounds worth, and all for a stag that could be worth a hundred pounds in venison products. If shot on the hill, the client may pay ten times that. So do you have to do a course for this, Neil? Yes. Yep. I mean, the tendency when you first use it is to still try and recover the deer yourself yeah. and not pay enough attention to what the winch is doing. So all you're doing is steering it and letting the winch do the rest. It's not a one person job this, is it? No, no. And, and the, the point we're making all the way through, this is resource heavy. 
So the other end, what's governing it is the speed that Stevie's feeding the rope through. It is very moose-like. It is, isn't it? But with moose, you've got a community doing it, not solo stalkers. Well, maybe, you know, the opportunity in woodlands, particularly as communities get more involved in land in Scotland, and I think that Cathy and I are very pro, maybe it's something they should do more of. And what we'll try not to do is destroy the woodland that's regenerating by winching them out. <laughs> So you can steer it. I mean, Stephen's controlling the pace at the top there, but we're steering it just by literally, I mean, there's no effort here. You can feel it yourself. All I'm doing is just steering him by steering his antler. And what range can you do this? I've got with ropes for this, I can go out 600 meters. Okay. Hold a minute. Hold. Now right, what we're going to do is run him up this post. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Keep him going. Oh dear! Edit! Edit! <laughs> That's on the to-do list, Stephen. Repair the fence. <laughs> you know what the device actually is? It's, it's a winching cone for trees. We could see when we shot him last night that he had bare tops, but really whatever head he had, where he was, he had to go. But the difference is in the daylight, you're automatically gathering a lot more information from that animal. You've got bare tops, you've got an old curly coat in him. He's, he's plus 10 years of age. At best, the way this animal has been taken, if we're lucky, there's a hundred pounds here. In resources, equipment and time, there's the three of us. So we've got our night shooting team, you've got your driver, shooter, and the uh, lamper spotter. What did that cost last night? And if we take all of our deer management to night shooting activity, then the five or six million pounds that's currently spent on the public estate shooting deer is going to be basically a drop in the ocean. So we need to develop new measures for managing deer. Our stag is back at the larder for Neil to assess whether, after being left out all night, it has any value. So what we did is we took all the red out of him. So by that I mean uh, the pluck. The pluck was extracted from the carcass last night and the back passage was taken out. So all we've had to do today was take the pizzle out, cut through the atrial bone and split the chest. And though it's been out all night because we've left it spread on the ground, it's come back in and uh, that animal's perfectly all right. That carcass is fine. But it's the challenge again that if you shoot something in a bad place in the hours of darkness, an extraction is going to risk your team then you've got to make a kind of a trade-off as to what you do with it. And if you do bring something back and you've shot it at night and it doesn't look like it's going to be suitable for, for further consumption for, by people, you can either divert it into your, your dog food operation or with some of them, if we get it here, we'll recycle them. And the eagles you saw over the skyline a minute ago are more than happy to tidy that up and get rid of it for us. What would have been the bad thing to do? The bad thing to do would have been to shot it, leave it lying in a heap, leave its internal organs in it, even if you take the stomach out, and left it to, to heat up lying on the ground overnight. And what you would have got is uh, you would have got the meat, what well, butchers will use the term firing. And no, so that it starts a decomposition pro process and makes it unfit for consumption. So if you do have to leave it, then what you want to do is open them up. Some people in a woodland area will, lift, will open them up, clean them, and uh, leave them hanging overnight and pick them up first thing in the morning. We have only seen the climax of the night shooting process, so despite the appalling weather, Neil, Stevie and Cathy head out again to try and show just what is involved with delivering best practice. So, OK, guys, I've been in touch with the police, filled in the, the standard request for information. We've got our start and stop time for the evening. Just because David's filming this so everybody knows what's going on, we're shooting under a uh, night shooting authorisation, 18.2 of the Deer Act. Uh, you can, Stevie's got it above the visor there if it's required and Stephen will be driving and spotting I'll be shooting, Cathy you'll be working the light David you're along for the ride basically to see what's going on and as part of the exercise we'll be using the Pulsar Thermal Accolade 
and recording some of that just to let people see when they're looking on what thermals look like versus what it looks like through a lamp and uh, we'll do our best to go through with you David as we're going and uh, what we're up to. The, the dog is in the back and uh, off we go. Some deer are lamp shy, some are clearly not. The one on the rock, David, see him? On the rock fire? Which one? Yeah, he's one with the, in the middle of the beam just now. Yeah. No backstop. These deer are on estate ground, not the open forest. They stand, and Neil can cast his eye over them. Good mature hind, strong calf, yearling stag. These are deer that are out in the open range. And uh, for me, there's nothing shooting-wise in that group this year at all and uh, they're perfectly safe because they're in the right place so they're not causing any angst woodland wise or agricultural wise. So what we're out looking for tonight is deer that are in the wrong place basically and when we can we'll get them out of an area and when we can't if uh, all other methods of control fail then uh, what you're seeing being demonstrated here can be used. The challenge that we have is that increasingly it's being used particularly by some of the government agencies as routine deer control and, and personally I think it takes a lot of the selectivity out of it. It means that if you do have a serious issue to deal with you've already used most of the things in your toolkit. So in uh, deer adapt very quickly to pressure. I mean you'll see in the areas where we have shot deer at night that they won't stand and look at you in the light like these ones are. That guy there, three. So people are shooting stags like that. And, and people are taking their heads home thinking they've shot a fine Scottish stag. That's three years old. Moving to the lower level crofts and the lamp lights up a fox. Neil is out and on it. You keep telling me that the only foxes you shoot are over 300 metres, so what's going on? I have no idea what happened there tonight. They did that just for you, David. That's the closest fox I've seen in the last six months. We're probably working hard to shoot maybe 40 foxes a year. But it doesn't mean that they don't have an impact and we're not just shooting them at a badness. Particularly at this time of year, the, the hogs, these things will kill the hogs and there's been a few killed in the fields here. Dog. Dog. Now there may be some watching who think that shooting deer at night is unacceptable. However, Neil has just taken this fox using the same methods he would employ with a deer. Is there a difference? Maybe it's the fox having canines that sets them apart. He's slightly different to your fox. Really? Yep, he's wider across the cranium. Where you'll find, I mean these guys live on the surface. The only time you'll get them in holes is at uh, cubbing time. We call this a Scandinavian well, they, they reckon that they are bigger. Okay. He's not particularly big. Back to the deer and Neil assesses more lamp-friendly animals. If you go back to the year in the life of red deer, yeah. the triangle, rectangle, instant fail. But you notice that he's short-bodied, shallow-chested. So he's rubbish now? He's rubbish. He's got a lower belly than his chest. Ah, he's just a poor, poor stag. Our last port of call is an area of forestry. We'd been here during the day. This is where the deer really don't want to be, even though it's all they know. So it's a very classically red deer in woodlands. So this part of the forest is now going into a harvesting stage. So what's happened is this has been pre-fell. That's quite an old hind, but she's habitualized to this area. So what will happen now is this will be harvested and then within a year or so this will be restocked at which point that hind that's lived the bulk of her life here and never been a problem to anybody is obviously a problem to the establishing woodland. After a long wet cold night we finally get into a good position on a red hind. You on her? Yeah. Straight down. And the animal's broadside there was now nothing in its in the way blocking its uh, the path of the bullet, we could see it clearly at a good solid backstop. That's what we're looking for, David. So, yep, yeah, I've been out in better conditions, but yeah. for the exercise, I think that was perfectly adequate. Oh, ho, ho. 
Carefully, you go there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe not stepping in that hole. Flip another side over. The weather's poor tonight, but, but it gives you an idea that when you're working with creatures that are shy, that every other method of control has been right. attempted, then uh, you have that in your toolkit to use. It's a problem animal we need to get rid of, but even at that, for what that carcass will be worth, it's been a cost, it's, it's not been a profitable thing to do. And as we expand woodland cover and we end up with more forest, then the management costs of deer are going to go up, they're not going to go down, which means we're going to have to think of other alternatives. And that means not losing the expertise that exists on estates all over this country. Neil tells us of estates dismissing numerous keepers as they diversify to meet carbon offsetting targets. The new owners think people such as Neil are history. He senses it's quite the opposite. I, I think it's a, going to be a, a big period of change, but it's going to be an evolution into something different. But the skills of a deer manager are going to be absolutely essential. Next time we'll be shooting deer in daylight and revisiting some interesting management ideas that are barely believable. It's just a joke. Disappointing. Thank you Neil, Cathy, Stevie and supporters of the Field Sports Nation who helped fund that trip, keeping government on its toes. Now to our own Twinkle Toes, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. An outbreak of bird flu in France could cause problems in six months' time when the partridge season opens. Movement restrictions in two areas where most of the UK's partridges are hatched threaten the import of chicks and eggs to the UK, though no restrictions are in place at the time of this recording. Bird flu has already hit poultry producers in the UK, with five cases in Wales, and at least one game farm is rumoured to be among those affected. Three people from the online country Squire magazine are defending libel charges brought by Chris Packham. A High Court judge has ruled that online articles about the BBC television presenter are defamatory, but that the articles contain statements of fact, not expressions of opinion. The defendants, including Dominic Whiteman, pictured here, will argue in a later court case that their facts are also true. Packham says they falsely allege he misled the public into donating to a wildlife charity to rescue tigers from circuses. The articles claim the tigers were kept in good condition at the circuses. Dominic would not speak to Field Sports News ahead of the trial, but in the statement he says that the preliminary trial has left him with a set of meanings that he and his co-defendants are happy to defend and he cannot wait to air these facts in a main trial. Packham supporters forced the GoFundMe website to take down Dominic's public appeal for cash to fight the court case. The Mirror newspaper claims that Boris Johnson has dropped the Animals Abroad Bill. The legislation is aimed to restrict the import of hunting trophies. The newspaper claims the government is ditching the bill, even though it was a pledge in the Conservative manifesto of the 2019 election, and it was announced in the Queen's speech last year. The article claims that pressure on parliamentary time because of the war in Ukraine has scuppered the plan. A later article on the BBC website quotes the government saying the bill will go ahead, but only if there's parliamentary time. DEFRA is contesting claims it expanded its definition of game birds to classify them as livestock. The Wild Justice Campaign Group threatens legal action over the issue because it wants to stop pest control, including crow shooting, to protect pheasants and partridges. DEFRA says the classification on game birds has not been changed or expanded. The Scottish Countryside Alliance is urging all country sports supporters to lobby the Scottish Government over the Hunting with Dogs Bill. Director Jake Swindles is appealing for the public to take action. It's not workable and it's not fair in its current form. Um, so, the, so the SCA put together a working group and on the working group there's a representative from each of the rural organisations within Scotland. Scotland um, and what we've actually done is extended an invite for Minister Mary McAllen to actually chair the group so we can hopefully work with the Scottish Government.
and try and get a workable solution for this. The League Against Cruel Sports has successfully lobbied for the bill to replace the law it wrote in 2002. The new law says no more than two dogs can be used to flush out animals such as foxes or hares unless a licence has been granted. Predators can only be controlled to prevent damage to livestock, timber or crops. The SCA accuses the government of damaging farmers' livelihoods with the bill as it deprives people of the right to protect livestock. Basque is also concerned about the new licences. Licensing itself just in introduces yet another layer of bureauc bureaucracy which isn't there just now so we could do without that. Um, and the 14 day rule is obviously quite restrictive. It's quite interesting there's another licensing provision that applies for conservation reasons effectively and these licences can be applied for up to two years. So there's a, a mismatch. There are certain licences for two years but the main licences that would be used for pest control are restricted to 14 days. Actor Peter Capaldi is narrating a new documentary about Scotland's salmon rivers. The feature-length film Riverwood explores how rivers and landscapes are being impacted by pollution and loss of habitat. The rewilding charity Scotland, The Big Picture, produced the film. It claims just 3% of the nation's woodland remains. The doco argues intervention is needed to restore Scottish riverside woodlands. The film highlights the plight of the Atlantic salmon. It claims the species is a modern-day canary in the mine. The documentary will be shown across Scotland in theatres, cinemas and art centres from May. Five hospitals in England are taking part in a trial to serve game meat. British Game Assurance has cooked up the plan to serve pheasant, venison and partridge to patients in London, Sheffield, Stockport and Darlington. Of course, game meat is nutritious, affordable, high in protein and low in fat. It's also good for patients who have difficulty swallowing. The Countryside Alliance is backing the trial. Thank you to Jeff Smith for the story. Colleges in Scotland are being inundated with applications for places on wildlife and gamekeeping courses. Lecturers say the modern gamekeeper must be a highly trained professional with a knowledge of theory and hands-on skills. The rural colleges work with 30 Scottish estates. The SRUC's Elmwood campus in Fife is operating a digital learning platform. It also offers students study trips and work placements. The college is training the gamekeepers of the future to offer estates national qualifications and practical skills. A conservation group claims that 5,000 red deer could be culled in a national park in Spain. Blood Origins says a ban on hunting in Spain's national parks introduced in December 2020 has led to chaos. It claims there's been an explosion in the number of deer and wild boar. The group, which is based in America, says the animals have been damaging habitat. The ban on hunting has also led to financial losses for locals who can't shoot. The Spanish government asked shooters to cull deer in the Cabaneros National Park in 28 days in February. Shooters refused as they weren't allowed to sell what they shot and the government refused to finance the cull. It can't go ahead until it's agreed who will pay for the project. And so you can imagine what that would do to the landscape from a tranquility perspective to a wildlife impact perspective. Um, to shoot that many animals in that period of time. And it's almost ironic a little bit, right? That the Spanish government says, do not, do not hunt, do not hunt, do not hunt, do not hunt. Oh no, we need to hunt now. And you need to take a phenomenal amount of animals in a very short amount of time. A Scottish hunt has raised more than 6,000 pounds for charity. The Duke of Buccleuch's hunt donated the money to the Hunt Staff Benefit Society. Donations were collected at a meet and a hunt ball at Floors Castle near Kelso. 600 people attended the event, which was hosted by the Duke and Duchess of Roxburgh. An auction at the ball boosted the total that went to HSBS, which provides a free pension for hunt staff. Archaeologists have uncovered some secrets of hunting in ancient Norway. They've identified more than 40 stones on a remote island mountain as hunting blinds. A report by Science Norway says hunters would have hidden behind the stone circles so they could get close enough to shoot reindeer with bows and arrows. The researchers claim the animals travelled into the mountains to escape flies. They also found 32 scaring sticks which would have been used to fly flags and iron arrowheads dating back to Anglo-Saxon times. Thanks to Per Holmseth for the story. And finally it's been a good year for flat coats at Crufts. The flat coat retriever Baxter won Best Gun Dog and Best in Show, beating 20,000 dogs to bag the honour at the NEC in Birmingham. The triumph left his owner, who travelled from Oslo in Norway, in tears.
After a one-year absence due to coronavirus, the event made a welcome return this year. Another flat-coated retriever won the North Esk Memorial Trophy in Basque's Gamekeepers classes at the event. Ruger is owned by Helen Fox, a gamekeeper on the weekly shoot in Northamptonshire and handled by her daughter Megan. It wasn't all about sensible breeds. Reserve best in show and winner of the utility group is a toy poodle called Waffle. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Next up, ferreting fun with Jaff and Wayne. A bit like me and him. <laughs> really, you know. They're not used yeah. to vast, sleek, glossy ferrets at the South Somerset Ferreters. When Wayne Martin turns up from Hampshire with his unusual Hampshire ferrets, comparisons are made. A big, chunky hob ferret. Um, I've had little ferrets, uh, you know, they're, they're quite nice to play around, but my big ones, you can really sort of put them about, scruff them about, lay them on the back, scruff their tummy, lay them on the floor, play around with them, you know. Obviously, you can't do that with every ferret, but the amount of time I've sort of spent with them over the last couple of years, playing around with them, they're just like little pets to me. I mean, they've hardly done any work, but, you know, they're going to come out today, they're going to have a crack, we'll stick a collar on them and see what they do. I thought it was a Labrador for a minute, but yeah, he's a big boy. I love it. I love that it's it's the whole process though, isn't it? It's the process of coming out, putting your ferrets down a hole, getting your own food. You know, I mean, obviously I know we're here predominantly for pest control, but the, the part of it for me is, is the other part of that. It's taking food home, being able to cook it and put it up on the table with a nice meal. That's the part I really enjoy about it. Uh, I'm, I am expecting lots of digging today because it's late in the season. We weren't going to ferret today, but the chap who owns the place and wants the rabbits gone because they're destroying his apple trees. Um, they're chewing all the bases around the apple trees, killing the bark. You can't have that. So, I mean, normally we'd, we'd have stopped by now. So, yeah, I'm going to expect a fair bit of digging. That's why we brought Wang. He's got big arms, hasn't he? You know, he's been pulling them catapults all the time. He's got big arms. <laughs> Wayne is a ferreter, which means he can dig but he has not been an active ferreter for a while. All my life I've brought up with various country sports. Ferreting around, around my way sort of died a death to be honest. And I met Jaff at the British Shooting Show the other week, got chatting, um, I've got some ferrets I've not really been able to use because the, you know, the rabbits have died off around our way. He's invited me up here for the day. Uh, I spoke to him on Facebook after we met and he said we're having our last day of the day this Saturday. So do you fancy coming up? So that was it. It's a secret location. We can't divulge where we are today for personal reasons for the landowner so we've got to keep that a secret but we are somewhere in Somerset <laughs> somewhere <laughs> it's sort of gone in stages for me I sort of brought up with shotguns and catapults and then I left the shotguns and stuck with the catapults for years and then left the catapults for a while and went back to my shotguns now I've left the, you know, left the shotguns gone back to the catapults and the ferret and it's all sort of gone full circle it's all, I've always been doing something it's always predominantly been to put food on the table that's what we were brought up with we were brought up to hunt to eat um, so it's, it's never that's what it's always been about for me it's so that's why I think I've always done a wide variety of things because it's always been about putting different foods on the table before the ferrets go down the holes the gang puts out the nets Wayne gets a lesson in putting out a long net yeah that's a lot simpler than I thought I think he sabotaged he did sabotage me that's the one that fell out in the van <laughs> so all the poles were over the place but I'm just about to go back now and even the net out along the uh, along the line it's got places where it's bunched up, even that out, and then uh, I can't wait to get to it, to be honest. There's plenty of rabbit activity here. The South Somerset ferreters use their own tiny ferrets to bolt these. One end of the berry is a main road. Everyone is nervous of rabbits going in that direction, so they deploy a human stop net. 
At last, it's time for Wayne's ferrets to have their moment out of the sun. Basically, this time of year, my young Jules, they're sort of starting to come into season. Now, Wayne's brought his in there. He's got one big hob. So what we can't risk is putting down the hole together. Obviously, big hob, little Jules in season. You know, hormones start kicking in. <laughs> I'll just put a little rabbit down in front of him and he's whoop. What, straight on it? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And that was the big fat one, so. Yeah. One rule is your ferrets, you got to dig them out. <laughs> first things first, Jaff shows Wayne how to put a ferret finder collar on his animals. Is what you don't want to do, you don't want the, the collar to slip over their yeah, head, yeah. you see. So, it's fiddly, isn't it, when they don't sit still? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I always do it that way. Yeah. So you basically just flip it around his neck. And, uh, tell you what, you older. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a strange ferret. Yeah. He hasn't had a collar on before. Okay, it's alright, buddy. It's alright. See? Yeah. <laughs> you put a collar on, <laughs> I'll hold the ferret. <laughs> right, it's me, Good. don't bite me. Yeah. First time for a collar, isn't it? He's a, yeah, he is, yeah. yeah. You gotta take these to the gym. Yeah. <laughs> Get on the treadmill. <laughs> Look at it. I've actually cut their food down. Have you? Yeah. To what? <laughs> You didn't see him before. Two pheasants a day. Yeah. <laughs> Jaff successfully puts one of Wayne's ferrets down a hole. Wayne is struggling with the other. The other one's down, right? Yeah, he disappeared, mate. It's like tremors, you can see the ground moving. <laughs> Eventually, both of Wayne's ferrets go down and they stay down. All the berries are kind of at the fresh earth around them, you know, they can see yeah. they've been in and out. So they are here somewhere. I think they're just massively giving us the, mud, the run around. Yeah, really. yeah. It's time for Wayne to get a lesson in using the ferret finder. Because now it's on search, he'll pick up the, like so a wider, wide yeah, wider range area. There we go. So now he's going... It's actually the pitch, it's getting faster and that's when you're getting closer to it. Yeah, and the, the red light will show you as it's going down here, look. Right. It's getting lower, well, it's staying around. And now he's gone eight from 12 to 8, look. Okay, so that means you're so getting to 12. Yes, yeah, so, so, ah, so you know it's around this area somewhere here, look. Yeah. Now my guessing is he's up here somewhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And now it's stopped. <laughs> Up comes one of Wayne's ferrets, then, like just when he was expecting to see the other appear, out pops a rabbit. They bolted one, they bolted one, and he's got through though. I think he's gone back down back down another hole that hasn't got a net on it. So he didn't hit the long nets, but he's gone back down, so I don't know where my ferret is, but they've bolted one. That's their first bolt. Your own ferret bolting a rabbit. It's a wonderful feeling. And eventually, it bolts one they catch. We've got dinner. Yeah, you've got dinner. We've got dinner. Yeah, we've got dinner. dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Who's cooking? Me. You? Yeah, yeah, I've got a speciality with that. That's right. <laughs> what a result. And the total bag is 13. You can find Jaff and the South Somerset Ferreters and Wayne and his catapult company, Caddyshack, on all social media. There are links in the description below. Thanks, Wayne Jaff, and all at the South Somerset Ferreters for having me along to that. Next, news correspondent Deborah Hadfield has been finding out how the hunting, shooting and fishing community has been helping with aid for Ukraine. Relentless, ruthless, horrifying. The Russian attack in Ukraine is leaving millions of people homeless. The refugee suffering is a call to action for shooters and hunters all over Europe. The Kimblewick hunt in Buckinghamshire is one of many collecting aid. The response has been overwhelming. This is just a fraction of what has been dropped off here. People have been donating backpacks, sleeping bags, blankets. Four lorry loads are on their way to Poland. People have come from far afield. We've been staggered by how far people have driven just to come and help to do their part and um, and then Sunday really is what blew us away. Sunday just took everyone's breath away. We had a convoy of cars down the road. Um, we had um, everyone in kennels helping, all the team, uh, the kids, our kids were helping ferry stuff out of people's cars. We had the public were, um, people who were coming to drop stuff off were literally staying for 45 minutes to help with sorting and clearing and putting into category stuff and 
yeah, it's been emotional. Feeding people is the top priority for the International Council for Game and Wildlife Conservation. Its members and partners are helping refugees who've crossed the border into neighbouring countries. Local hunting associations are running food distribution centres. The CIC is donating game meat, equipment and materials. The Angling Trust in the UK is running a fundraising appeal. The money from Anglers for Ukraine is being donated to the Red Cross. People value the fact that as an angling community uh, we can play our part and our part can be you know, properly, properly registered. Um, we're doing this as anglers as well as members of the human race. Well, to me, I spent a lot of money in tackle shops, I spent a lot of money on baits, and I think, well, perhaps a proportion of what I'm going to spend on my pleasure could go to providing medicines or providing warm clothing for people that really need it. So perhaps a little bit of our fishing budget this year could go to helping not just our fellow anglers, uh, but our, our fellow citizens in Ukraine who really do need our assistance at this terrible time. Angler Ian Smith of Outlaw Pro, a fishing supplies company in Essex, has donated £10,000 to the Trust's appeal. He gave all the takings from his stand at the Big One fishing show in Farnborough. Well, I think just because Ukraine is so close, there's always somebody that's been really personally affected. And whenever I've spoken to people, you know, friends, relatives, work colleagues, you know, we, we've said, um, you know, how terrible it is. And then there's always a, a, an, an additional comment about, oh, yeah, my next door neighbor's sister lives there or oh, my brother's partner, she's from there. And the, the, there's always some connection somewhere to that sort of region of the world. And um, it, it, it's I think it's just such a barbaric war, the way, with the way that the, the bullying has gone on with these people who just want to live in complete peace. Richard Walton sent thousands of coats to refugees with the Coats to Syria appeal. The keen stag hunter in the southwest of England has set up a Just Giving page to raise £5,000 for Ukraine. Most people have been affected by what they've seen on the television and it really does um, give an easy way for people to donate directly to charities. And the wonderful thing about the... Um, Disaster Emergency Fund is that the government is actually match funding any donations made. It's a very fluid situation. And that's why I decided that it was important to give money to charities who can actually react and respond to that fluidity. Christopher Scheib is an angler with a fishing lodge in Norway. He's leading convoys from Germany, rescuing refugees who are crossing from Ukraine into Poland. We haven't been very successful in the last uh, two or three days at the Polish border itself because um, we're exactly where the um, bombs went off on the um, on the border with Poland. Uh, the, the eight kilometers, uh, it is the distance to the um, airfield and the military base that was uh, bombed by the Russians. Um, so the refugee stream has uh, trick, started to trick a little bit right there. Our refugees that are here, um, I have to say so far, they've all been brilliant. Um, I mean, it's a long trip. Some of them have been, you know, on foot for four days with small children. Some of them have been traveling for eight or nine days, uh, sometimes without food. Um, and so far, every single family or every single mother that we relocated, among the first questions that they ask is, where can I work? That's something I find extremely um, fascinating. It's, I mean, they, they, don't, they will take our help, but they don't want to be dependent. As refugees flee from Ukraine, the things they need change. Some of the aid taken to Poland was dumped. People are being asked to check what charities need before they donate. As the crisis gets worse, millions more people from Ukraine will need help. Aid like this will make all the difference. The field sports community is rallying to support the refugees. Links to the appeals are in the description below. Thanks to all for those interviews. Now the Field Sports Nation prize draw this week. And it's for a set of Muller chokes, kindly donated by Premier Guns at Doveridge in Derbyshire. 
Muller chokes range from £99.99 .99 to £149.99, .99, and different choke sets are designed for different guns and shooting, including Wildfowling and Browning and Winchester, Invector and Invector Plus systems, Blaza, Caesar Greening, Maxis, Kriegoff K80, and others such as Perazzi, Bretta, Benelli, and Zolli. The SS or stainless steel and the H20 waterfowling chokes can shoot a steel shot through a full choke. Premier Guns in Derbyshire is the UK distributor and there's more info on the range on Premier's website, link in the description below. I can hear you beating the screen and shouting, enough, enough, for you want to know how to win a set. Well, the fastest, easiest way is to watch Field Sports Extra out on Tuesday nights exclusively for our Field Sports Nation supporters. And so the quick way to do that is to become a Field Sports Nation supporter. Plus, you'll pay for us to make films like our Ukraine news feature and the political stuff with Neil. Link to the Field Sports Nation in the description below. Next, from the former and maybe the future Soviet Union to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the top hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First up, a little bit more from Wayne Martin. He has a mooch around the farm and takes an uncontroversial duck. Next, more from Jaff. This is the same day as the ferreting in this week's show, complete with Wayne and Jaff, but filmed by the amazing M. Spielberg Jefferson, Jaff's daughter. We featured it in news last week. It's in Hunting YouTube this week. Here's Vinnie Jones on his new Crafty Countryman channel. He's talking about different kinds of game bird. It will come as no surprise that most Ukrainian hunting channels on YouTube have moved to DEFCON 1. Here is one that translates as IBIS Hunting and Arms, which normally covers hunting and shooting sports on how to maintain your gun on the battlefield. Here is a typical Russian hunting channel, and it's showing ordinary hunting sports. This film marks the opening of the Russian goose season on the 12th of March. In Australia, Edge of the Outback is out to get a few ferals on the deck and set up some trail cams. He has a good go on the foxes, and there's some top quality quad bike riding too. I usually watch the hunting videos on the white a Moana channel and I still can't pronounce that word. This is a fishing film, Dry Fly for Brown Trout, on the lower Rangitaiki River. And finally, British shooting writer Michael Yardley talks up shooting sports in interview with Nigel Farage on GB News. Start watching at 38 minutes 15. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. Click like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, and best of all, pop your email address into our register page, and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain. It's at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.